Good afternoon. Good morning in Japan. Uh, welcome to the Japan Zoomina at UC San Diego. I'm Ulrike Schede. I'm the director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. JFIT is at GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. We are an international relations and public policy school here at UC San Diego. If you're interested in our program offerings, please go to gps.ucsd.edu. And at GPS, we have JFIT, the Japan Forum, uh, which is a Japan center that uh, links San Diego to Japan. More on our center you, uh, is at jfit.ucsd.edu. Uh, we also have a bi-weekly newsletter called the News Flash, which you can find on our website on the News and Media button. I also have my own website, if that's not enough, and you can go to the Japan, the, the japanologist.com for a blog on what's going on in Japan. The JZ, the Japan Zuminar, is a weekly event. We meet Tuesdays at 4.30. And of course, today we're gonna to talk about Japanese telcos. And next week we'll have professors Gracia Leofera and uh, Michael to uh, Strauss uh, talk about immigration policies in Japan. Uh, we'll then take a, uh, a winter break, but don't go away, stay with us. We will be back in 2021 uh, and uh, launch the 2021 series with a conversation with Jesper Call uh, on what to expect in Japan next year. Um, all right, so with that, uh, we're gonna go to the Japanese telcos. And so this is the thing that I posted on my uh, LinkedIn page. And before I introduce our speaker today and our guest today, let me just uh, motivate this. So we've, we haven't, other than SoftBank, we haven't really heard a lot about the Japanese telcos in a while. And uh, that's probably a mistake. And, I, and if it's here that you've heard it first, I would say uh, underestimate NTT at your own peril. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on at NTT, uh, including that they recently, of course, repatriated Docomo into the group. And uh, NTT Data is uh, perhaps Japan's most global IT company. And then there's, of course, KDDI, uh, which runs, uh, among many other things, an open innovation venture fund. It's one of the largest Japanese funds in Silicon Valley. There's a lot of innovation going on there. And uh, what you're here uh, today to hear about, of course, is probably SoftBank. Uh, and we're not even sure, as you'll hear uh, soon, whether or not SoftBank is still a telco or, or just a private equity fund or what it is and what it does. And, um, and then you might wonder why I have Rakuten uh, on this uh, collage and the and the answer is open ran and we'll talk about open ran as well it's sort of a next big thing in telco and uh the first time i've heard about it was in relationship with uh mr mikitani the ceo founder and ceo of rakuten who is making a big investment in open RAN. so i look at all of this from a strategy perspective and i'm excited about the vision and what's going on in the telco industries. But um, I need to know, I wanted to know a little bit more and want to get a little bit deeper into the weeds of what these companies are actually doing and how we want to interpret what we're reading in the news. And so I invited today's guest and I couldn't think of anyone better uh, to invite but Mark Einstein. So let me bring Mark on. Hello, Mark. Thank you for joining Hi. us today. Good morning. Mark Einstein is the chief analyst uh, for telecommunications and digital services at ITR, a boutique consulting and research uh, uh, company in Tokyo. Mark joins us from Shiga Prefecture. He, he knows better and he lives right next on Lake Biva and I'm envious. So, um, so Mark is an insider on, on telcos and IoT. He's been based in Tokyo for 10 years. He's analyzed the telecommunications industries globally for the last 15 years. He's worked before uh, in Boston, Hong Kong, and Singapore, uh, Pyramid Research at the Greece Strategy Group at Frost and Sullivan, and uh, joined ITR a few weeks ago, a few years ago. He uh, has basically covered telco 
from 3G and 4G and 5G and now 6G and also knows everything about Open RAN, which we uh, want to hear all about. So, uh, Mark, thank you for joining us. I uh, oh, I should mention that you have a, a, a BA in business and foreign languages from Washington University in St. Louis, which uh, I thought was interesting. I didn't know you could get a BA in foreign languages. So that's that's great. So, uh, Mark, welcome and thank you for making time on your busy schedule and joining us today. No, oh, thank you. I'm delighted to, to be here. So let's start with this open RAN thing. I want to hear all about, uh, you know, uh, Miki Tani-san. So the, the, uh, the Economist uh, in their Schumpeter section, you know, maybe uh, two, two or three weeks ago, had a piece titled uh, Miki v. Massa. And it had this sort of uh, son on the one hand in SoftBank and Miki Tani and Rakuten. And the article was about open RAN. Can you explain to us, there, there, there are some people in the audience that are technology specialists, but uh, I for one am not. And uh, oh, before I, uh, before I start, uh, let me just say, we're not giving uh, investment advice here, <laughs> big caveat. And uh, uh, certainly I am not, I have, I've not, I just mentioned NTT, but I have not looked at the stock price. I don't know whether they, they're a buy a hold or a sell. Uh, I'm just a researcher and you will also, when you listen to us here through the entire show, you will realize that we're actually not on, of one opinion on these companies. So uh, we would make uh, bad advice anyway, but I just wanted to make sure that it is clear that, that we're not doing that. Um, and audience, if you have questions, feel free to type them in in the Q&A button. Uh, and then I will try to weave that, uh, those questions into our conversations. So back to Open Run. Uh, what, what is it, uh, Mark? And, and, and then, then we'll go from there to Rakuten. Great. So um, perfect. So I think what I'll start off by doing is explaining what Open Run is, hopefully in a way that would be understandable to people that aren't necessarily technology experts. And so basically, um, Open RAN um, basically stands for uh, RAN, which is a radio access network. And, and what this is, is basically a mobile network. It's the, the towers and, and the base stations and all the infrastructure um, that makes up your 4G network that you're probably using today. Now, if you're a telco, if you're a Verizon or a Docomo or a Vodafone or a, a T-Mobile, basically the way that a network is purchased today is that a telco will go to a vendor uh, and basically the, the big three vendors in the world are Ericsson, Nokia, and Huawei. Um, basically you, you buy this network from them and um, they install it and then you run it, right? And you're typically buying it from one or two companies. Um, and so you could say that radio access networks today are closed um, and they're mostly hardware defined. So you have you know, lots of boxes, switches, routers, all this kind of stuff. Um, but what is so interesting is that, you know, this year we're starting to see a movement towards something called open RAN. And so RANs, the radio networks, instead of being closed, are now becoming open. What this means in layman's terms is that more and more of the network is not only becoming software based instead of hardware based, it's becoming open. So it's kind of like open source software. So instead of buying my mobile network from Nokia or, or Ericsson, I can actually just buy some very simple hardware and then use software from lots of different vendors. Um, and basically what that means is that because I'm moving from hardware to software, it's more flexible and I can choose different vendors for different things. So instead of just using a Nokia or Ericsson, I can buy basically an empty box and I can install different, think of like apps. So just buying a, a cheap, smartphone and installing different apps for security and network traffic and all this stuff. Now, the implications are potentially this could be much cheaper. Um, and, you know, these cost savings in a mobile network could be passed on to consumers. And we'll talk about that with Rock 10 in a minute. So that's one really important aspect of Open RAN. But the second important aspect is that um, there's more competition. And so vendors that are making this software now have a chance to get in with these telcos. And this has implications for companies around the world. So there are a lot of startups that are offering open RAN software, uh, especially in the US. Um, but even companies like NEC and, and Fujitsu we're seeing are starting to mount somewhat of a comeback in the mobile network business because the, uh, it's more software defined and more open. 
So that's just hopefully a, a, a somewhat clear uh, explanation of what Open RAN is. So it reminds me a little bit of the early days of the personal computer when uh, there was an open architecture and we could actually in the old days buy you know a box and a motherboard and stick some stuff on it and then we'll buy software here and there and we'll put it all on and then we are off to go. And so there might be more competition on the hardware because we can now in, in, in this case as well, right? And then there's a competition for the software and because it's open there will be much more competition. So the the losers here are the are the guys that that make these big turnkey installation now, like so Ericsson, Nokia, and Huawei. Is that right? Yes. So um, that is correct. They have the most risk. Now it should be said that you know Nokia and Ericsson are are also developing open RAN products. Uh, Huawei is the one company that has said no, we're we're not so interested. So. Um, they have the most to lose, but they are aware of this issue and, and they do have open run products, but you're correct in your assessment. So then, then why is, why is uh, Mickey, uh, Mickey Tani-san uh, betting the barn on this? What, what, what does he want? Why, why does he want to be a telco? Okay, so this is a really interesting question. So, um, you know, to give everyone a little history. So, as you mentioned, Japan has, you know, three main mobile operators, which are Docomo, KDDI, and SoftBank. Uh, the Japanese government for many years has wanted a fourth telco to promote competition in the market. And so they've been trying um, ever since I was here. And so about 10 years ago, there was a company that started as um, the fourth mobile operator called eAccess. Uh, and the business, they did okay, but they were actually acquired by SoftBank. And then we went from four back down to three and that became Yahoo Mobile, which is one of their sub brands now. Um, so basically Rakuten has been operating in Japan for several years as an MVNO, uh, as, which is a mobile virtual network operator as opposed to an MNO. What that means is that Rakuten has been offering Rakuten Mobile service because they've been leasing capacity from Docomo and reselling it under their brand. Now, what they've decided to do is go one step further. And so at the end of last year, they started Rakuten Mobile with their own network. So they built towers and, and infrastructure and all that themselves. But what they did was they did it um, using Open RAN. And you might want to say, well, why couldn't they just stay in MVNO? It's a fair question. The reason is what they're saying is, is that using this open RAN has lowered their cost structure by so much, they can pass these cost savings on to consumers and have a new business model. And as a result of this, Rakuten Mobile is currently offering free mobile service for one year to up to 3 million people in Japan. Basically, what Miki Tani-san is thinking is that by passing these cost savings on to consumers, Mobile becomes a loss leader. People come into the Rock 10 ecosystem and he makes more money from people spending more money on e-commerce or Rock 10 games or travel or, or financial services. So this is a really innovative um, you know, uh, attempt. It is something that is being replicated overseas. So DISH in the US, there's a company called One in One Drillish in Germany that wants to do this. Um, and you'd better believe that Amazon, Google, Apple uh, are all watching this very closely too. Well, certainly in the United States, we can use a little bit more price competition. That that Absolutely. that sounds right. All right. So so my guess is that the others are not sitting still, right? So how? Uh, so let's let's stay with the 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 outsiders before we go to the telco. So we have a question already actually from Hiroki who wants to know what. Uh, Fujitsu and NEC are doing because NEC, first of all, just got lucky, I guess, uh, that because of the decoupling and the Huawei limitations, it has new customers, including the UK for a 5G network installation and then also some places in the US, I guess. So there's NEC. How about Fujitsu? And, and, and then NTT, by the way, bought 5% of NEC to develop this, right? Correct. So that's a really interesting question. So basically, because I mean, there, there are two things going on. Um, one is that as maybe a lot of people know on this call, you know, Huawei has been banned from many countries um, for mobile networks, including Japan, Australia, UK, US, 
Um, so this is making, this has basically made the market a global duopoly in, in some countries. Um, and so there is a chance for another player to come in. Um, so that's part of it that's not really related to Open RAN. But the second part is because of Open RAN. Um, and so basically what has happened is that, um, you know, because of Open RAN, uh, NEC and Fujitsu can now offer software in combination with other players. So for example, Fujitsu, I really can't remember the last time Fujitsu won a 5G contract really anywhere outside of Japan. They won one with DISH because of Open RAN, um, working with a, a startup in the US called Oteo, Oteo Star. So um, I think NEC and Fujitsu are both really excited about 5G. And this is the first time in, in 10 years I've, I've ever really seen this. Um, so that is definitely something to watch. So what, what's NTT up to? Why did they bring Docomo back? And what, what is the, do they have a, do they have a vision or do they have a plan? Okay, so that's another really big question. So NTT, I think is second only to Toyota in terms of number of employees in Japan. It's, it's a behemoth. They have hundreds of subsidiary companies and basically NTT for ages has been trying to figure out how to put Humpty Dumpty back together. Um, so they were deregulated um, by the government. They were split up just like um, AT&T and the baby bells were back in the day to, to make more competition. But as the telco market is, is a lot different than it, you know, it was in, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, now they've been trying to bring it back together to basically try to streamline operations, to become a bit more profitable, to become a bit more globally competitive. Um, and so their latest step has been to bring Docomo back into the fold, as you mentioned in your opening. Um, so really what I think is going on there is that, you know, Docomo is a standalone company, I think performs fairly well, and I think certainly much better than some of the other NTT group companies. But I think they decided to bring NTT Docomo back into the fold because of 6G. Uh, Japan kind of missed the boat on 5G development. Uh, the government is aware of this. They've, they've talked about it. Um, 6G, which, you know, it, it's very early to be talking about 6G from a, a layman's perspective, because, you know, 6G will be coming around 2030. But from an R&D perspective, it makes absolute sense to be talking about 6G now. Um, and so basically NTT has its own vision for what a 6G network could look like, but so does Docomo. Uh, Docomo has more 5G patents than any telco in the world. Um, and so I think what their, their vision is, is to bring NTT R&D, Docomo R&D, and also NEC, which is a, a major 5G patent holder as well, all together to make a 6G powerhouse to try to really position Japan as a major 6G vendor, even though this is a ways away. Well, that will be interesting to watch, right? So, I mean, so, so it's, a, it's a great vision, you know? So the question is, can they, can they do that? Mean, meanwhile, what's KDDI cooking? I mean, they, they can't be just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. They're not, and, and KDDI is kind of the middle child. So um, they're not as conservative as NTT is, but they're not as aggressive as SoftBank is. Um, they have made some overseas investments that have done pretty well. So for example, they invested in uh, the biggest telco in Myanmar right after um, the country kind of opened and, and they've done really well there. Uh, they also own the largest telco in Mongolia. Um, but what KDDI is really up to is, is quite interesting. You know, they, um, and all the telcos in Japan, but they have been really interested in this idea of after smartphones. So when we talk about 5G and even 6G, there's this concept that, um, you know, in the 5G, mature 5G and 6G era, you know, we're not going to use smartphones as much. And this might go to XR. And by XR, I'm talking about augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. And so a lot of their investments and a lot of their product development recently has been focused on using smart glasses as the next device after smartphones. So 
So basically in, you know, five to 10 years, maybe we're all wearing our Apple glasses over 5G, walking around and getting real-time information about the world around us. And so they've done some very, very interesting um, partnerships with some um, augmented reality glass companies. Um, and they've also done some, some really interesting um, proof of concepts as well. So I think that they um, are focused on this kind of um, activity for, for the next generation. So you're right and that they're not you know, twiddling their thumbs. Okay, so you mentioned SoftBank, so let's let's go there, shall we? Um, so everybody wants to know about SoftBank, but you know, SoftBank is mm. an interesting place. We've both been following SoftBank for many many years, and um, I, you know, I just think that whatever SoftBank does is, is that there's a pattern, right? There's a pattern in terms of. So, for instance, we I, I once did a little study where I looked at every time uh, the, the stock price. Uh, and the uh, Sunsun's big investments. So by Vodafone, uh, by J Telecom, uh, you know, do this, do that. And it turns out that the stock market doesn't like his big bets. So when he makes a big bet, the stock price falls. And then a few weeks or months later, everybody says, oh, he's onto something. Okay, and so it goes back up, right? So, so he's been in, he's been making these wild, wild uh, investments for a long time. He started out with um, when he was a PhD student in Berkeley. He he met Jerry Jerry Wang. He bought a third of uh, Yahoo, and then Jerry was friends with Jack Ma. So uh, Masa bought a third of uh, Alibaba. And basically that was a golden egg. And, and since then he could just make these, uh, ever since he's made these, these big investments. And so, so why is he even in, in this game? I mean, SoftBank is not the number one cell phone provider in Japan, right? No, so they are um, close to, you know, number two and number three are kind of neck and neck between KDDI and, and SoftBank. Um, but, but basically, you know, my take on this is that you know basically, you know, you know, ten years ago, Sonsan was talking about the end of telco, and you know, Masayoshi San I think has probably made more money than anyone in Japan, but I think he's also lost more money than anyone in Japan. He's he's a gambler, he's a, a the definition of a serial entrepreneur, um, and I think that you know basically he you know made that investment in yahoo he made, he had the vision to to get into alibaba in china he saw that way before anyone else um and then he basically bought vodafone japan and made that from an epic failure into an epic success um he's never been afraid to take risks uh and basically i think increasingly um softbank as a telco is basically a, a cash cow for his investments and um some of them I would say some of them are opportunistic um, as a way to, to, to make more money to invest. I think some of them are more visionary, things like AI and, and self-driving cars and, and IoT and, and robots. Um, you know, I, I think that they definitely had, took quite a beating um, over the WeWork debacle. Uh, but um, some of these events, like just today, uh, Salesforce acquired Slack. Um, for $27 billion and, and SoftBank owns 10% of that. So that's, you know, a six time return. So he, and, and they're still investing just this morning, they've been announced investments in logistics and, and a startup in Sweden for $700 million. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I do see SoftBank as a VC um, and really telco is an afterthought at this point, and it's just you know something with a strong cash flow that's going to keep funding these these ideas. Well, it's more than just a cash cow; it's recurring profits. So banks love this sort of thing. Yeah. So he can take this to the bank and say, "Give me a loan over so hundred many million dollars because I got this every. I can tell you what my profit's going to be over the next ten years." Right? Yes, that's right, and and he's done exactly that several times. Although now comes in Prime Minister Suga, who wants to, um, for reasons that escape me, um, make s lower the the prices for the mobile subscriptions in Japan across the board. Right? Yes. The, will that change SoftBank's strategy? Does, if, if if this recurring profit kind of diminishes, is that is that going to be a wrench in his throw wrench? So, in his I think that. 
own son saw this coming. Like, you know, like 10 years ago, he was talking about are telcos a, a dumb pipe that are just providing data down a tube, or are they a smart pipe that are using intelligence and getting into other businesses and things like this? Um, so I think he definitely saw this coming. I think the reason they bought into Sprint in the US was to kind of hopefully raise a second cash cow, which didn't exactly work out for various reasons. Um, so I think that they're aware that, you know, this cash cow, you know, is going to be on the decline going forward. Um, and they might be looking for another cash cow, which, for example, is why they put a lot of money into the largest e-commerce player in Brazil, because e-commerce maybe in the pre, uh, post COVID-19 world becomes more of a cash cow than telco. So I think that you're correct in that assumption. Um, and I also think that they're aware of this, too. I think that might also have been behind WeWork, right? But, you know, WeWork kind of going, how could he invest in WeWork? But in Japan, WeWork is actually a, is actually a recurring profit operation. Right? Oh, sure. It's, it's real estate. It's, um, it, you're right. It, it's, it could be a cash cow in theory. Um, a lot of my clients use it. It's very popular here because I think as, as anyone on the call in Japan knows that they're, you know, before Corona at least was this never ending shortage of, of meeting rooms. So a lot of companies really appreciated WeWork and, and still do. Um, it's just the valuation was just ridiculous. I mean, it was 10 times its closest competitor, Regis, um, because I think a lot of companies in, in, in Silicon Valley and elsewhere kind of realized, hey, if we just call ourselves a tech company, we'll get 10 times the valuation than we would otherwise. And so you saw a lot of companies that were not tech companies um, calling themselves tech companies. And I think the markets wisened up to that a bit. Um, but you still do see it. Um, so let's, let's take our crystal ball back out and talk a little bit more about the future. So there is, I know I write about this in my book a little bit, and I would like to hear whether you, you have any, any reactions to this. So SoftBank has a joint venture with Toyota called Monet Mobility Network. And the vision is, and, and, and Honda is now part of this as well as, uh, as, as are Daihatsu and some others. And the vision, as I understand it, is that uh, Toyota has these AI taxis now that look like the old London cab and they drive around Tokyo and they listen to what we say as customers. They know what we look like. They know what food we like. If we go up, you know, we talk about the restaurant and this dish was really good. Then if we are a SoftBank customer, they know our, they, they know us, right? Because we might pay with our, well, we might pay with a Suica card, which could also be part of this, right? And, um, and then the idea is that they take these taxis after two years and send them um, as, as used taxis to Southeast Asia, other countries, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, and then map uh, those areas and collect a lot of data. So it's a sort of a little data drilling enterprise where then SoftBank and Toyota both get these data and can position to compete in the digital transformation. So I'm, I'm totally excited about this. I think this vision is uh, it's outstanding. Uh, is there anything to it? I mean, are they going to do it? How, what, what's your view on, on these sort of forward-looking Japanese bets? Oh, this no, there, there, there's a lot to this. Um, so I think that, you know, you know, we've all kind of, I think, thought about and, and dreamed what, you know, real self-driving cars are, are going to be one day, which I think we, we will see in, in our lifetime. Um, but from a business perspective, you know, you, you know, of course, SoftBank has invested in Uber. Um, Uber is never going to make money if they don't have self-driving cars. I mean, basically, it's been in the, the roadmap since it started. Um, to have self-driving cars and, and eliminate the cost of, of the drivers. And once that happens, it's going to be a cash cow. And so the, that has always been the dream. Uh, actually, SoftBank and Subaru just did the first self-driving test on a highway with no driver uh, yesterday. So yes, this is the vision. Uh, I think in Japan, um, you know, for, for senior citizens, I mean, it's, it's a huge social problem now senior citizens causing accidents um, because they maybe can't see so well, but they have to get around. So that is something that, that everyone's really interested in as well. So I would even say that there's a social aspect to this, that you know Japanese companies are, are very socially conscious typically. Um, and then basically, you know, really refining that, honing that here and then exporting it. 
um, is, is absolutely the, it, it's a perfect vision. It's wonderful. Uh, I would even say that it might include other technologies. So for example, even now in Tokyo, there are taxis that, that have the, the display screen that actually have facial recognition technology. So sometimes I get into a taxi um, and the screen basically sees me and sees, ah, this is a man and he's you know maybe 30 to 40-ish and they will show me an advertisement based on that. But if it's a 20 year old woman or an 80 year old man, it'll be a different ad. Um, and you can even pay with your face now. NEC is developing this technology. So I'm, it'll just see my face and, and I'll walk out of the taxi. So I would say that it, it's gonna go even beyond what, what we're talking about. Um, so I love the vision. Um, as always, I, I think Japanese companies are really top notch when it comes to dreaming and, and thinking about the future. What I worry about is the execution. So, I mean, what are they really doing on the ground in Southeast Asia to make this happen today is what I would wanna know more about before I would really buy into or, or invest in this idea. Well, that's also, that's always the, the, the thing, right? Um, you work with the telecom on a, on a daily basis or a weekly basis or what, on a regular basis. And um, they, it's that's always the the big puzzle about Japan, right? One wonders why they can't be faster, more agile, more nimble. Why why everything has to be done so carefully, and whether they're missing out on things. But maybe in this particular area, they're not missing out. I mean, how how does all of this that we're talking about stack up in global comparison? Is Japan ahead or behind or normal or average? So that's an interesting question, and I think that's a debatable question. I, I think that, you know, I would say that in terms of just pure innovation, um, U.S., I, I don't think you could argue is, is, is not number one. So I think, um, you know, we get a lot of questions about, um, you know, how to emulate Google and, and Amazon and, and Apple um, in Japan. Uh, we increasingly get questions about BAT. So um, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent in China. So they are aware that these are, are up and comers as well. Um, I think Japan is still up there, but I think that the innovation is still driven by the large enterprises in Japan. And I would say the kind of old school companies. Um, and again, a, a problem that Japan is, is acutely aware of is that they are not as strong in the startup space. Um, and what's interesting about this is that there has been a lot of progress. So when I moved here 10 years ago, startups were rare. Um, and you used to hear stories about university grads that would wanna join a startup and the CEO would go have to meet the parent and explain the business plan because that's just not acceptable. You know, if, if you're a good university student, you go to a big Japanese company. Um, this is changing. There are a lot more startups now. There are a lot of organizations. There is a startup community here, but there is also an understanding that much more needs to be done. So I think in the startup space specifically, Japan is behind, but I think that there is still a lot of R&D being done here by the big companies and Japan still very much is a global leader. So I would maybe argue number two or number three, if you wanna look at the EU holistically or, or country by country, um, but, but China is, is very much rising and, and this is something that, that Japan is aware of. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is driving this, right? So the, we, some people talk about the two lost decades, which I don't think were lost at all, but they were just a big transformation and reinvention. But what really sped things up for, for Japan is that they realized that there's no way they can compete with China. So there's suddenly there's this new, you know, there's this new uh, purpose. Uh, having caught up with the United States, okay, so there's a new purpose. We can we can be ahead, and we can we can maybe be a technology leader in, in these things, right? Yeah, I, I think it's quite interesting, even from my own personal experience. I mean, ten years ago, my Japanese enterprise customers, if they were going to do something in AO, IoT or AI or, or whatever, um, would just you know automatically go to Fujitsu or Hitachi or NEC because that's just how things were done. Um, but these days I get a lot of questions from my customers saying, Mark, you know, we, we want to do this, but we can't find a startup or a company in Japan that can do it. So Mark, you please go find us a good startup in, in 
US or Europe or Israel or, or wherever. Um, so I think that attitudes are changing um, and there is definitely more of an openness to, to work with startups and startup scouting and, and startup matching is, is a lot of my business these days. And it was zero 10 years ago. So um, uh, there goes back a little bit to SoftBank and Toyota, but but uh, it takes us back to the telcos a little bit. And then Ben has a question about how about Toyota's woven, woven city? And so Toyota's woven city is a is a very interesting project. It's a uh, the idea is that the Toyota is taking and is, is building a city that uh, is on the land of a previous plant. So it's not very big, maybe a, a square mile or two, or two square miles or something like that. But it's it, not only is it um, a the the new the next vision for transportation and self driving buses intelligent homes. I'm sure there's a lot of telco intelligence there and new things. There's uh, the energy is it's it's uh, it's hydrogen powered, is that right? So there's it's also that's completely, um, you know, it's uh, it's carbon zero, there's the waste is handled in a particular way. So so how, how does that push the field? I mean, this sounds, it's another one of these examples that sound really great. How does that push the actual today's business or, or tomorrow's business maybe? So that's a, another really interesting um, concept. And so um, this is a conversation that I've also had with telcos and, and other companies, but you know, basically, you know, again, they're, they're so good at thinking about the future. They're thinking 30, 50, 100 years in advance. Um, but if you look at the demographic, demographic trends, I mean, everyone knows the population is declining. Um, you know, people, not living in Japan might not know that a lot of cities are consolidating, you know, surrounding communities because the population is going down. Uh, you might see news articles about all the empty houses in, in rural areas, abandoned houses. And so Japan is thinking about, you know, are we going to have to basically have these mega self-sustaining automated cities, which might have a lot of elderly residents, you know, do we need these technology powerhouses to kind of rebuild society? And people that are interested in this concept, um, there's a term in Japan called Society 5.0, which has been postulated by the government as the predecessor to Industry 4.0, which kind of takes Industry 4.0, which is basically about smart manufacturing, but extends that to all of society. And the government has published some information on English in English on their websites, which is quite interesting. Um, but this is kind of uh, aligns with that vision. And so um, again, it's not just about self-driving cars, it's about an automated sustainable society. And I think this is going to be an overarching theme in all Japanese technology in the coming years. So it's, it's very appropriate to, to mention it. So since you mentioned the government, we have two questions on security and government regulation. So Dave would like to know, and this goes back to the open RAN, but I guess, or whatever it is, 5G, 6G. Um, uh, Ron wants to know whether new regulation is necessary if we make this switch. And, and Dave is wondering whether it's as secure if it's open or whether there will be now I'm kind of, I'm, I'm still thinking with my computer uh, sort of analogy, whether we need virus checkers and so forth. Uh, so, so, so what's the state of the art inside there? Okay, so regarding security for Open RAN, uh, that is a challenge. And um, I think basically, you know, once you have things that are more software defined, once you have things that are, you know, using more vendors, the chance for security you know, glitches and, and bugs is, is much greater. Uh, I think interoperability is also the other big challenge with Open RAN, because if you have all these different systems talking to each other, you, you'd better sure that, be sure that they work um, and that they work together. Um, so those are two big headaches, and this is something that will absolutely need to be addressed. Um, you know, something generally with 5G is that it involves more, you know, basically towers and, and, and you know, small cells, which is also a security issue. So um, those who are concerned about security with Open RAN are, are very correct in assuming that that is one of the most worrisome issues about the technology. 
And how about the role of the government and all of this? I mean, so one of the interesting things about the digital transformation is that we don't know where we're going. And so I feel sorry for the bureaucrats who are sitting there thinking, OK, we have to regulate this thing. But how can you regulate something that we don't even know what it's going to be like and what the use cases are going to be and how this is all going to play out? So so how do how how, how does the how does the, the uh, Somusho, whatever this MIC, uh, thinking about this issue. Right. So I think the first step that they took, and this happened a while ago, was that they banned Chinese network infrastructure from Japan. So uh, actually, SoftBank, uh, unsurprisingly, was the one telco that did have some Chinese infrastructure um, inside. That had to come out. So that was actually ripped out and, and replaced um, by with European vendors. So um, they've tried to make it, um, you know, only infrastructure from trusted country partners was step one. Um, and step two is that they have mandated certain um, levels of cybersecurity specifically as a condition of 5G licenses. Now, um, is that enough? And is Open RAN going to require even more regulation? Quite possibly. And, and I'm sure that that is an issue that they are looking at. Um, but I think it's worth mentioning that you know cybersecurity as a whole is one of the areas where Japan has lagged behind. And you know, recently in the press, um, there have been a lot of security breaches with the PayPay payment system here. Um, and Japan Post Bank and, and some other banks have had to stop using it. Um, even Docomo had a major security breach. 7-Eleven uh, started their payment service. They had to stop it because they were hacked so aggressively. So I think that um, cybersecurity is, is something Japan, frankly, needs to improve on immediately um, and needs a lot of help with. And, and I think that, that foreign companies can, can certainly play a role here. And is this, this whole open RAN thing, uh, is this going to make this business more global? So, and, the, and what I have in mind with this question is that, you know, uh, we will all recall that 20 years ago, NTT Docomo was chastised for being a Galapagos. They, they were unable to bring IMO to the US when maybe in reality, Americans weren't ready to use a phone for their data. So, so if you look around the globe, it strikes me as if, it looks as if, Telecoms are fundamentally domestic players for whatever reason. But if we do have open RAN, is, is there a possibility for more global plays? I mean, so could could uh, you know could could NEC become NEC the NEC NTT new new thing that they're building there? Could that become a mega global player, or are they bound to stay domestic? So they could. Um, they absolutely have a chance. Uh, I would say before Open RAN and Huawei, they had a much lower chance. Um, so their chances have greatly improved. Um, and in fact, the UK government and the Australian government have invited NEC to come and show them what they can do. So they're not pushing, they're being pulled, um, which is a very, very new phenomenon. So the chance is there, the opportunity is there. Um, but you know there are there is competition. So there are some up and coming American players who are very strong. Uh, Samsung is very aware of what's going on, and um, they just won a massive deal in the U.S. with Verizon. So they're around. Um, and again, you know, this will not be decided by Japanese R and D capabilities. It will be decided by Japanese sales and marketing capabilities, um, which. Uh, I, I think you know very well um, are, are, are quite different. Let, let me go back to that in a moment, but, but, but we have a, a, a people here from Japan and they, they're interested in what's going on in the United States. Did the United States lose out on some of this? I mean, there's no equipment company here, is that right? Okay, so basically what happened here was that uh, when I was a just started as a, a telco analyst, you know, 15 years ago, there were about 10 to 12 players in, in this space. So we had Alcatel, we had Nortel, we had Motorola, um, we had Siemens, we had, um, you know, many, many, many companies. Um, and there was massive consolidation largely because Huawei, you know, came into the market and was very, very price competitive. So, you know, gradually these companies um, consolidated 
Uh, and as a result, um, Motorola and Lucent is, was the other big American one, um, went away. And Nortel, which is Canadian, went away. And so the, America currently does not have the capability to build its own network. They have to rely basically today on um, Nokia or Ericsson for end to end. And this is something that has always been a concern um, to the, the Department of Defense is, is in that the US does not have this capability right now. Um, so whether or not open RAN players come in and fill this gap, whether or not um, a big American company acquires a Nokia or Ericsson, which is a whole other topic and whether or not that would even be permitted, I'm not sure. Um, but yes, it, 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 America doesn't have the capability to, 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 to do this. Uh, Japan mostly does. Um, Europe, you know, Sweden and, and, and Finland certainly do. Uh, China does. Um, so yeah, that, that is an issue. Uh, and that is something that, that the US government has been concerned about for, for some time. So the US has no capability right now to build a 5G network. Nope. That is, that is uh, remarkable. Uh, so, okay, so let's go back to the, to the economics of this. We actually have a question from, from Andrew who wants to know whether uh, this, this so back to Open RAN and Rakuten. This, will that really pay? Uh, uh, you know, can can the cost reduction? Uh, you know, are, are the cost reductions real, and uh, are they scalable? And and is this can Rakuten really win this uh, in terms of a dollar and cents sort of, you know, way? Okay, so that's an interesting question. So, and my take on it is, I have no doubt that you know, using more cloud, more software, more AI in mobile networks is the way things are gonna work. Um, I do think the cost savings will materialize at some point. And I think, to give you a good example, um, NTT Docomo in its network operation center has about 2000 people. So these are the people that are currently watching the network, you know, in that NASA-like room and, and seeing what's going on second to second routing traffic, dealing with security issues. Um, and they're doing all this, or most of this stuff manually. Rakuten has 100 people in this, in, in this team um, because AI is doing it. And so when they say 30 to 40% cost savings, I can believe it. Um, now this technology is very young, it's very immature. These algorithms that they're talking about have not really been trained so much yet. So, um, and I think what Rock 10 is finding is that they still need people for things like customer service and, and all that kind of stuff, which they're, they're paying the same as, as KDDI or SoftBank or Docomo. So will this materialize right away? No. Will this materialize in the future? Possibly. Um, but that being said, you know, Rock 10 has been offering um, you know, up to 3 million users free service and they have not sold out of it yet. So, um, you know, there, there have been some teething issues there. Um, so are they going to make money on this mobile network? I'm not sure. Uh, but I, it is worth pointing out that Rakuten is a major shareholder of one of the three up and coming open RAN startups as a vendor in the United States, which is called OTL Star. So um, the telco might never make money. Um, I'm not sure that it was designed to, and I'm not sure how that plays off in a, in a, from an investor perspective, um, but they might recoup that money as a vendor, especially if Altio Star continues to get more business and, and goes public at some point. That, that sounds more likely because I, you mentioned earlier that, you know, the way they may draw this up is that they say, okay, we're going to give you the access for free and you will always land in Rakuten land, right? So you will land in our, uh, you know, in our you know, portal with our e-commerce and our offerings. But if it's all open, I mean, it's easy to get away from that, right? So they can't really force us to do that. So then they wouldn't necessarily have business uh, coming out of that in their core business. I'm not even sure what their core business is anymore, actually. I mean, they're making money out of the e-commerce, but it's, it, it sounds as if just like um, Sunsun is a little bit bored with being a telco and he wants to do other things. I'm wondering whether Miki Tanisan is a little bit bored with being an e-commerce guy. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair assessment. I think financial services probably 
is is profitable for them. And and again, I think it's the the similar idea is that if e-commerce and maybe financial services can fund some of this more uh, risky stuff, uh, I think that's how Rakuten is also going to continue to 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 grow going forward. So let, let's go back. I mean, there's this kind of elephant in the room, which is like sort of the SoftBank question and the not not just the Vision Fund, but the other didn't didn't SoftBank just recoup a ton of their losses by 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 shorting the Nasdaq and investing, and then the news sort of took. I mean, the the, the, the journalists that I read at least were a little bit upset about this. I thought it was a governance issue and how can a telco be a hedge fund and is it okay for Son to short the NASDAQ and is he, is he shorting basically his colleagues and what, what's the story there? What's the scuttlebutt in Japan about that? I mean, what's, what, what were the views on where SoftBank is headed with this? I mean, I think that everyone, it's, it's no secret that he's opportunistic and, and if he sees a way to, you know, Make some make a quick buck, and and you know especially given what happened with WeWork, and and re, um, improve investor confidence in the stock and the company and the prospects for Vision Fund Two. He's going to do that, and he's not going to feel bad about it for a minute. So um, I think that that is well understood in in Japan, and and people might complain about it, but um, I, I think that that is definitely modus operandi and and completely unexpected from from my perspective. So what's what's the future of SoftBank then? Where 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 is that company going to be? And, you know, so we never know, of course, because Sunsun is so such a entertaining uh, business person and so surprising. But but is, is it is it basically a private equity fund now? I, I think that it is. Uh, I think that if you look at a lot of the very recent investments, and and like I said, they're still making investments even even today and and yesterday, uh, new announcements almost every day from this company. Um, it's interesting that they're really honed in on industries they think are going to be big pre-COVID-19, uh, post-COVID-19. So I think like logistics, self-driving, robots. Um, there, there was some news today that um, you know there, there are maybe some people looking at Boston Dynamics. So he might walk away with with money from that. He's going to walk away with money from Slack. Uh, I think he will continue to look for maybe new cash cows, especially if, if revenue is going to decline in the telco world here. I would suspect that might come from e-commerce because that's going to be bigger now in the new normal. Uh, and that's uh, an industry that he's had success in in the past. So I think we might see more e-commerce investments in countries like India and Brazil. Um, Self-driving AI. Um, all these things are going to become more and more important. And I think some of these things like traditional telco are going to become less and less important. This is kind of how I see them going from here. So it's not as if the arm, he bought arm, right? So that was one of the biggest M&A deals, maybe what is it, five years ago or something, a little longer. Yeah. Yeah. A British company whose technology sits at the core of a lot of the things that we do with our cell phones and up from there. So it, it looked as if he was selling ARM to because he needed money yeah. after the WeWork debacle. Is this going to set him back in, in, this, in this vision about, you know, then there's Pepper and Pe Pepper can see and, you know, and all of that, those things that yeah, I mean that was a <clears throat> that was a forward-looking investment because you know they're they're a chip company and with IoT, if we really are going to go from you know ten billion to hundred billion connected devices, you know everything's going to need a chip, right? And so that was a I think a forward-looking investment. He very well might sell that if if he needs to. Um, well, he did, sure. right? He, he sold yeah, it, it selling selling it to Nvidia. Uh, yes, I, I'm not sure about the regulatory approval there. Um, I know that there were some concerns raised in the UK. Um, so I'm not sure if that's 100% final um, or not. But um, yeah, I mean, he, he will continue to, to do these kinds of things. And, and Slack is, is even a, a more recent example. I mean, it's just his, his, his MO. He, he bought into Supercell, which is a gaming company, uh, a Finnish gaming company. Um, and he spun it off two years later and made like $3 billion. So um, if, if he sees a, a, a good price, he, he, he'll sell with, with no question. 
And I think that's true for almost any of his properties. So is there a company in Japan that's doing interesting things that I have not asked you about that or a development that 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 is important that you think will determine how we communicate or do business or in, in the future? Is there, is there a development there that I should have been asking about that? So I think one of the things that was more recent is that Yahoo Japan is integrating with Line. Um, and so that will create a new juggernaut in terms of payments and, um, and a lot of other services that might emerge as a competitor to Rakuten. Um, so that's another area where Rakuten could, could feel some heat. Um, so recently that's been in the news quite a bit as well. So I think that's worth mentioning. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I'm looking whether we have other questions. Uh, and I think, let me just see. Um, you mentioned that, and, and this is the final question, I mean, it goes back to the regulation and, and antitrust has been a big issue in, in the sprint deal that didn't quite happen like Son wanted it in the, the NVIDIA deal that you just mentioned. Um, Rakuten might run into it if they, if they do the, if they tie their stuff together too much. Some of the American companies that are, uh, are of course under, under the uh, looking glass now. So, so does the, what's the role of the government in all of this? Can the government help this? Is there, is there a, a sort of a developmental state sort of Japan model where the government can do something that really benefits these companies or um, are the watchdogs important or how do we want to think about this from a public policy perspective? What is there a, uh, the, the future is unknown, but what, what do we need to make sure that, that, that we all have for society to enjoy all of these things? So, so this is, again, this is very much my opinion. And, and this comes from someone that, that does work with the telco industry, you know, for, as a disclaimer. But, uh, you know, one of the examples that I really like is maybe people on the call don't know that uh, Korea, South Korea, is very much the leader in, in 5G right now. Um, South Korea started their commercial 5G network in April of 2019, and they already have about 90% 5G population coverage, and they have probably the end of the year with maybe close to 20% of their users on 5G. The government forced the companies to be really aggressive in the 5G rollout. This enabled Samsung to develop equipment before other companies. Samsung just replaced Nokia in Verizon for $5.6 billion and overnight became a major 5G network vendor. So if the Japanese government really wants to encourage Japan to become a tech export driven country, again, like it used to be, I would much rather see them be aggressive in terms of developing products and services that they can sell elsewhere, as opposed to slashing prices and, and lowering revenue and profits. So if the government does want to encourage Japan to be, you know, a major technology exporter again, they should encourage them to develop things quickly that are resellable overseas, is my take. So Korea did this uh, with a CDMI early on, right? Didn't they, uh, they had a, they, they, they basically said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do CDMA. And, um, and so the Korean companies were really. Um, Not uh, even that, they were the only country in the world that forced the carriers to use GSM and CDMA so that Samsung and LG could develop the handsets and sell them all over the world. And it worked beautifully. Beautifully. So, so Korea is a slightly smaller country than Japan, but maybe Japan could go back to the playbook and basically force feed the companies into getting that together. That's, that's I mean, to be fair, you know, Korea can't rest on its laurels because it's much smaller. So that's why there's no Galapagos. So they have to be export driven, but I, would also like to see Japan be a little bit more export minded in terms of the tech industry. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, thank you very much, Mark, for joining us. And thank you, audience, for being with us. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. I could go on for hours, but uh, I guess time is up. And so thank you very much, audience. Uh, as you run away, uh, remember, we'll be back. <laughs>
next week talking about immigration. Uh, so we're going back to the political science part of our uh, uh, Zoominar uh, uh, discussion here. So see you next week. And thank you again, Mark Einstein from ITR. And Pleasure. Uh, very good. And thank you, everybody. And goodbye.